What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. Two quick announcements before we start. Uh, the Black Friday sale and the SwiftUI Fundamentals pre-sale is ending December 1st. So that's 40% off the Take Home Project course, iOS Dev Launchpad, and SwiftUI Fundamentals is 25% off. Again, through the end of December 1st. And announcement number two, uh, I got dinged by YouTube for having a link in one of my older videos that now links to a deceptive website. And it was my first warning because I've never done anything like that before, obviously. But it said if it happens again, I can start getting you know strikes on my channel. Three strikes and my channel's done. So uh, I got to take this seriously. Uh, how this matters for Swift News is I got to be careful like what links I include in the description. So my initial solution is I'm going to create a GitHub repo, uh, which is the readme that I will link to that will have all the links on it. That way, the link from YouTube is just to like my GitHub. So I know that's good. Uh, this just happened like two days ago. So I don't know if this is the, the permanent solution, but this is what I'm going with right now. We'll see how that works. So again, if you don't see links in the description, uh, check out that GitHub repo, which that will be in the description. Okay, let's throw up the rundown and get into the show. First up, I just have some App Store reminders for you. Uh, App Store Connect holiday schedule, right? Uh, new apps and updates will not be accepted December 23rd through the 27th. This happens every year, obviously for the holidays, but if you have an update or new release coming out towards the end of December, uh, make sure you plan around those dates. And then next, another quick reminder, we have the uh, privacy question requirement start December 8th. So that's about a week from now. So if you haven't done this, uh, you better get on it. And again, it's kind of this privacy, you know, I've heard people call it a nutrition label, right? Nutrition facts kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, if you wanna have information on like how to do that, the link is in here, learn more about the details you'll need to provide. Here you go, and here's everything you need to know. Uh, here's another screenshot of it. Uh, everything you need to know about this to get it implemented. But again, December 8th is when it starts, so you got about a week. Moving on, we have an article from Antoine Vanderlee uh, all about getting started with property wrappers. Now, let me tell you my journey with property wrappers, right? So these were announced in Swift 5, Swift 5.1, not quite sure that's irrelevant, but uh, recently is the point. So I kind of like read about them when they first came out, but I never used them because again, they're brand new. And uh, I didn't really start knowing what they were or understanding them until I really started diving into Swift UI about six months ago. Because Swift UI has a ton of like default property wrappers. So you kind of learn what they are, what they do. But the reason why I liked this article from Antoine and it was timely is because now that I've gone through that journey of just kind of like using them and learning what they even are, this article talks about like how you can build your own property wrappers. And he explains, right, a property wrapper can be seen as an extra layer that defines how a property is stored or computed on reading. Here's the key right here. It's especially useful for replacing repetitive code found in getters and setters of properties. So the example he uses is the user defaults. And I like that he used this example, even though it's kind of redundant in SwiftUI because the new in iOS 14, they have app storage, but it was nice to see and help me understand like how app storage may have been like written under the hood. I'm not sure if this is it, I didn't look, <laughs> but uh, you can see how in, in UI kit, right? You have uh, these getters and setters is repetitive code. If you've used user defaults, you know, you're just like set value for key, you know, get value for key essentially over and over again for all your different keys, right? So it's repetitive. Uh, well, this talks about how you can write your own property wrapper and here's the implementation of the property wrapper. Again, I know I'm going kind of quick. This is just the overview. Again, link will be not in the description, it'll be, in the GitHub repo, that link will be in the description. I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up a bunch when I say, oh, link is in the description, you know, years of, of saying that. But anyway, you can create your own property wrapper, you know, for user defaults and then use it uh, nice and neat like this, like for example, on an extension on user defaults and then the call site, really, really simple, you know, has, has seen app introduction false and true. And this does all the uh, user default stuff like kind of behind the scenes, you know, in the property wrapper that you see up here. So again, uh, I have been using property wrappers, the default ones in Swift UI, but this was a nice look at like, okay, how could I potentially use these like on my own, create my own property wrappers. So I enjoyed this article. Next up, we have a new Swift clip from John Sundell, all about managing URLs and endpoints. Um, and this is nice. He goes through, he like walks you through a story, right? Talking about the problem and then does various stages of a solution until you get to the final one. So you can kind of see how it evolves over time. And who knows, maybe, you know, partway through that evolution is the best solution for you, right? Maybe you don't need the fully evolved version, right? So I like how he walks you through that, but it's, essentially it's just that, right? Here's the, here's the problem. You know, if you have your network call, load article, you know, you need a URL, and the worst case scenario is just having all your URLs individually defined right within your network call. Well, the whole point of this video is 
managing URLs and endpoints. So again, he walks through various different ways to organize all these URLs and endpoints, right? Here's an extension on URL. So it can be uh, nice and clean. You don't have to define the URL at the call site. Then he evolves it even further with like a, an enum for an endpoint. Then he evolves that even further with like a struct to, you know, build your own endpoint. So again, it gets into a pretty complex solution. I mean, it's not that complex, but it evolves uh, again through the, the story I felt like he was telling me on like how to, how to really refactor this. So again, if you're struggling with how to organize your URLs and endpoints and like your network uh, calls, network manager, whatever you have implemented, uh, this was a great video. Next up, I have a bit of an update from a story I featured last week. So last week I said there's a new SF symbols out 2.1. There's over 40 symbols, but I couldn't find like release notes that showed me what new symbols there were. Well, luckily we got Jeff Hackworth here, developer of the app Adaptivity. Check that out, it's great for developers. Uh, replied to my Swift News tweet saying, hey, I, I, I saw you talk about SF symbols. Here's what's missing, right? So he did a nice blog post. Uh, where, you know, what changes are in uh, SF Symbols 2.1. If we scroll down here, nice image of the iPad. And by the way, this is the app Adaptivity. Uh, it does a lot of great things for developers. I've done a whole video featuring it a while back as part of like an indie app uh, promotion. But anyway, here are the 40 new SF Symbols. Go ahead, pause the video here if you want to take a look. Um, but that's that. And if I scroll down here, here's the, the strings associated with that uh, if you want to check it out. But anyway, that is the update to the new uh, SF Symbols. Moving on, we have an article from Federico, uh, the Swift protocols and Swift UI. Now we just talk about a few here, right? Hashable, identifiable, uh, equatable, equitable, equatable, who cares? Uh, so we talk about these three, there's plenty more in Swift UI, of course, but uh, it, these are nice like uh, foundational type protocols that you should know to kind of understand like how Swift UI works uh, under the hood because it's completely different than UI kit. And the first one he talks about is a uh, equitable, equitable, whatever, uh, is the unsung heroes of Swift UI's performance. Because if you don't know when the data change, like Swift UI compares the layouts, does a diff, and it only changes like what is needed to be changed. And it knows that based on running a diff, right? It says nothing is redrawn unless deemed necessary. Nothing is computed unless there's demand for it, right? Well, how do you you know, see if things are different, right? Well, that's where the equatable uh, protocol comes in. And if you want to take a deeper look at that, uh, here's uh, Javier's mystery behind uh, view equality that he links to. So dive into that. And then we'll just do one more uh, identifiable, uh, understanding how this works. This is typically used in lists, uh, as Federico says here, right? So the items in a list need to be identifiable. So if you reorder stuff, uh, it knows what item to reorder, or he, he brings up a good uh, case here, right? If, uh, imagine a list of elements where some reordering might happen. Well, if the reordering doesn't involve any like other change, like you don't need to redraw the cells, you just need to reorder them. So only the list will need to update the cell uh, order, but no cell will need to redraw. And then conversely, right? Like if there's no reordering, but you just need to redraw the cell, uh, et cetera. So that's how identifiable uh, comes into play uh, with list. But like I said, Equitable, identifiable, hashable, those are all very uh, fundamental protocols to understand for Swift UI. So take a look at this article if you're a little foggy on them. Moving on, I have a tweet about how to get your indie app like uh, press, or it doesn't even have to be an indie app, I guess, whatever app you're working on, if you want to get it pressed, like on blogs and stuff like that, some tips on how to do that. And it's from Oliver, who's a writer at iMore, and it's in response to, to this tweet uh, here. Well, actually, Charlie Chapman, another indie developer, responded to his tweet about you know how to get press. So he said, do you have any advice uh, for folks on how to send app release details your way? I know from talking to a lot of indies, they find cold emailing writers really intimidating. I'm curious what you think, et cetera. So here's some a good list of things to do, right? So logistically, his email's in his profile, cool, whatever. The content of your email should be a short blurb about what the app does, you know, what platforms it's on. If you have a press kit, that's great. Uh, details on what what's new if it's an update, and here's a big one screenshots and lifestyle images in particular are awesome. And you put awesome in like bold, right? For those listening on the podcast, I wanna emphasize that. Uh, link to the app and the website. So I think it really boils down to like, just make it easy, you know, for the person, right? Don't write the review for them, but you know, give them all the information uh, and screenshots and pictures they need, you know, to make it easy on them. Moving on to AR Corner, uh, disclaimer, I don't think this is AR kit, but I'll play the video down here. Uh, it was like pretty cool. You can see like, here, I'll, I'll make this smaller so you can see what's going on, um, right? There's like the making of on the bottom, but then the results on the top. But I thought this was really cool because what I what I think about like when I see this kind of stuff is like children's books or educational books for, for young kids, right? Um, I don't know, just imagine those type of, of books here. Uh, storytelling would be cool. Like you can imagine a story like that. But anyway, if you're wearing AR glasses and you have this thing that you hold and you can see a story play out or educational content for a children's book, I just think that would be awesome. 
And finally, the LOL of the week. This one hit close to home following a coding tutorial. The guy's face at the end cracks me up. It's only nine seconds, <laughs> right? There's the tutorial on the right. I'm trying to follow, we've all been there, right? The guy's face at the end though, makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah, coding tutorials, am I right? Anyway, that wraps up this week's episode of Swift News. Again, the Black Friday sale ends tomorrow. So if you're interested in one of those courses, you haven't gotten it yet, uh, you have one more day. All right, we'll see you in the next episode.